heaven is for real. We know that. If it wasn't, God wouldn't give us so great of peace when times of death come our way. He would not give us so much confidence knowing that this is not our home. If you look around at our world, the evil, the evil that is reigning. I mean, just in the news this year, I mean, we hear about massive worldwide pedophile rings, sex trafficking, corruption in governments all around the world, wars, famines, not to mention COVID and everything else. It's like, wow. I mean, we're just bombarded with evilness and adversity. And we're thinking to ourselves, how can it get much worse? It can. I, I look at the news and I think, how can someone, how sick would a person be to traffic children? How evil a person must be. And we're not talking about, we're talking about people we don't even know. I mean, they're, they're like naming doctors, uh, you know, political leaders, uh, movie stars, things like that. It's like, wow, what a sick world we live in. And then you're reminded, the Bible says the world loves evil and darkness. And it tells us in the last days that evil will be called good and good evil. And we can see that today where the people that are evil are lifted up and those that are trying to expose them are, they're bad. And it's like, wow, aren't you glad heaven's home? Can you imagine just picture yourself. It's hard to picture, I know. Yourself not saved one minute. How would you be going through this? How would you be going through this? When the storms of life are howling, where's your hope? When the news is feeding death, 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 death. I mean, they're dealing death. You can't even, I'm tired of the news. I mean, I'll open up Google and all of a sudden, then the first three articles are all about the death rate. Death has been all around us, but why is it being so promoted? It's sensationalized. And then this is like, we're being constantly fed up, and people are like, I mean, snapping, put your mask on, do this, do that. It's like, wow, touchy, aren't we? You know, it's like the other day I walked in the store, and my nose is literally, because it's been broken, it was hurting. A mask hurts after a while, and I've tried to be courteous to people, so I had pulled it down a little bit because my nose was throbbing. And a lady walks by me and goes, put your mask on. I said, it is on. Over your nose too. Technically, I have an exemption. But it was like, wow, good morning to you too. I guess you didn't have enough coffee this morning. But it's like, I see the people today is just like, wow, calm down. Take a chill pill. You know, I'm not sick. But it's like, our world is so afraid that I might have a bug. You might have a bug or they might have a bug. I, and the only way, if everybody's wearing it, they'll have, then why is the rates going up? If all this is supposed to stop? And these are questions, but what is the root of all the problem? It's not COVID. It's not pol political corruptness. It's not the sex trafficking. It's not the drugs and alcohol. It's a heart issue. The Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible gives us so many reasons that the reason man is so troubled is because they're not confident in where they're going and they're uncertain and they don't want to go. They can talk about heaven all they want, but they really don't want to die. I don't care. Just like Lori said, if Brother Nye is to go home, if I'm to go home, if my father's to go home, that's in God's hands. I'll see them again. If you were to go home this week, I'll see you again. We're going to have a celebration. And I pray that if I go, you guys will have a celebration service because I just graduated. I just moved.
My address changed from Harmony Road to Heaven's Boulevard. It's not bad. Yes, I will miss you and you'll miss me. But time will go just like that. I pray that none of us go by the way of the grave, but by the way of the air. But if God tarries, we'll all go by the way of the grave. But good thing about it is heaven is for sure. Because God would not have wrote in the Bible, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you may be also. What assurance that God says, if I go, I will come again. And we know that God cannot lie. So this is a promise you can take to the bank. This is a promise we can carry with us that in my Father's house are many mansions. If we have accepted Christ, then we will, guaranteed, go to heaven. The Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. How did Paul know that? He said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, but you know he was because he was stoned. He was dead. And God says, not time, Paul. Go back. You know, this is where we know, and he says, I cannot write this. Why? Can you imagine the beauty he must have saw? John gave us a little glimpse of heaven, just a little glimpse. And he said he fell on his face in front of the Lord. Man, I... I just read the first two chapters of Revelation and you get a glimpse of how holy our God is. And I just read Revelation 20 and 21 and I see how beautiful our home is. I cannot imagine. Words cannot describe it. And that's what he basically says. We just can't put it in words. How beautiful it is. John tried. With the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote some things down, but seeing it, it's going to be speechless. Amen. And this is where tonight I want to look at some biblical facts. We looked at the three types of heaven, the first, second, and third heaven. But I want us to look at some biblical facts of our home and see from God's word why heaven is for real. Heaven is our home as Christians. This world is going to pass away. The heavens, the stars are going to pass away. But the new heaven that's created, wow, it's going to be beautiful. Why? God always does the best. God never does anything halfway, even if it is through traumatic circumstances. I look back, and my faith has been weak at times. God, you know we needed it then. Why now? Why then? You know, there's questions in my life. I falter. My faith gets weak. I see what we don't have. I see us foregoing. And God, God you know we have. The, you know we're trying to be fruit. Why? God has a purpose because there was somebody he wanted me to meet. And he had to work in that heart of that person to get him to where he would talk. You know, how long did it take? The interesting thing about it, he said it happened about two years ago that he realized he needed God in his life. But he says, I'm not a religious man. God's been working on him for two years. To get him to the point to now. God knows his timing. Because he's the Alpha and the Omega in the beginning and the end. Christians, don't give up. 2020 may be an unusually weird year that's going to try us as Christians and as citizens. But God has a plan. Use this, as I said this morning, as a light. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost.
And right now, our light should shine the brightest and the darkest because our world is getting darker by the minute. When evil is lauded and good is condemned, you know we're in a dark time. But it's always darkest before the dawn. And this could be the 11th hour and the 12th hour is coming when we hear that trumpet sound. We must make sure our light is burning bright and our loins girded about because heaven is our home. But heaven's not the home of billions of people. We must do our part as Christians to witness and share our faith. But you know what's better than sharing? Living. I, you don't, I can't tell you how many times people say something's different about your family. It's not our words, folks. It's your actions. It's your consistency letting God live through you. That speaks volumes. I've been around a lot of families, but your family's different. Yeah, there's a difference between religious family and a Christian family. Big difference. Like I've said, it's knowing Christ and knowing Christ. Many people are going to miss Christ by 18 inches because they know him up here, but they don't know him here. And this is where our world is. Religion doesn't mind shutting down doesn't mind closing the doors because if you're not really committed to God, not really saved, church is not really, not, it's kind of an option. Yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe. But when you're a born again Christian, church is essential. Church is a needy part of your week. Why? Because it's where you worship the Lord. And this is where a lot of these churches are not, they're just churches. And as I was reading an article, it says, how many churches will still be preaching the Sunday after the rapture? Boy, that really struck home. I thought, wow, how many churches in Oshawa will be coming back to the pulpit? Now let's gather around. And the church is still full. We're going to find a lot of make-believers, amen? And that's going to be tragic. But think about the preachers as they stood in the pulpit year in, year out, telling everybody, as long as you're good, long as you're going to go to heaven. And never telling them the alternative. The wages of sin is death. As tonight, as we open up the Bible, turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I want us to look at some biblical facts. First of all, we know our God is an eternal God. But God created heaven. It wasn't always there because God doesn't really need heaven. It's where he resides now, but God's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient. He's everywhere. He's all powerful. But God, in Genesis 1 1, the Bible says, In the beginning, now we're talking about the beginning of time for us, <laughs> there's no beginning of time for him. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we see here that God creates our new home. As we know in the Bible that the angels are created, it was in that beginning when time began for humanity that he created the heavens and the earth. He created the angels. And I, sometimes I wonder, one of the greatest questions I ever want to ask, why did you create man knowing they would fall? You know, if I was an omniscient, powerful God, now this is a very lame thing to say, but if I, w I would not create us with a will. I'd create him. But what is the purpose of man? To fellowship with God. If you have to fellowship with someone because you have to, it's not out of love and devotion. Matt gave a good analogy, making someone marry someone. You're going to marry me. That's really going to go well. But God knows what he's doing. And this is where the Bible says, and before the time was found, he knew he would send his son to die for the world. And he still did it. Talk about divine, infinite love we would never understand. Wow. That's our God. 
Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6. Revelation 10, 6. Once we're there, we'll open in a word of prayer. Revelation 10, 6. And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein are, and the earth and the things that are therein are, and the sea and the things which are in therein, that there should be time no longer. There should be time no longer. God's not on our time clock. Never has been. Why? Because it says, who created the heaven. Well, but wait a minute. But him that liveth forever and ever. He's eternal. <laughs> there is no time clock in heaven. Oh, it's 12 o'clock. It's time for lunch. Oh, it's 5 o'clock. No, there is none of that. That's humanity setting that. But God, there is no time. The Bible says in Isaiah, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Think about us in heaven, eternally. Oh, they're going through a thousand years. Wow, that, that went by fast. <laughs> We're not even going to think like that. Why? We're going to be in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it won't be long enough when we worship him there. Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being here again tonight. Thank you for the testimonies. Thank you for the songs. Lord, thank you for your blessings of this church and all that you've done. Lord, but most of all, thank you for the blessing of salvation and the shed blood of the Lamb on the cross of Calvary. That those that receive Christ as their personal Savior know, can know that they know they have a place in heaven as their home. It gives us the hope for each day no matter how dark the day is, we have the brightness of God's word to know that in it are so many promises that guarantee us that we are not here forever. We're just passing through. Thank you for your blessing of God's word and the trueness of it and the assurance of faith you give us to live this life that we are born into. Thank you for all you've done and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Not only is heaven created by God, heaven is everlasting. If we turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, while we're in the New Testament, then we'll swing back over to the Old Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, the Bible says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Not made with hands. No man made heaven. God did. Do you notice that God, only thing he formed was man? That is the only thing in Genesis 1 that he actually touched. He spoke, let there be light. Let it, heaven and earth be separated. The firmament, this, and, you know, the animals. But he personally had a personal touch on man. He formed him from the dust of the ground. Aren't you glad that he touched us? He didn't just speak us into existence. He touched us. And when he saw that man was not good to be alone. He personally did the very first surgery. And aren't you glad that God did not take a woman out of the heel? Did not take woman out of the head or neck or any other part of the body. Took out of the part that protects a man's heart, the rib. You know, this is so special when you think about the analogy of how God you know what the greatest thing is? A good wife will protect her husband, and a man will protect his wife. Their help meets. Their, that's something close to his heart. And you know, when you think about it, as you're sitting with your wife, your loved one, you put your arm around them. Where's that rib? Right here. You pull them tight to protect them. You know, so many things. There's great analogy. But God did it once again as a picture of love and compassion. And once again, he took a rib from the man and formed a woman. 
Once again, it wasn't just let there be a woman. God put a touch on her as well. This is why it is a slap in the face when our churches begin to preach that there are multiple different sexes. It's a slap in God's face when the world says that there is umpteen dozens different. When God says male and female created he them male and female. God's touch. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are not some slime ball that created from a big bang. We are touched by God. Amen. We did not become a salamander to an ape to this to that. We were touched and formed by God himself. And to say any other is, is just an insult to God himself. And Romans 1 tells us that they turned against the creator. And that's exactly what they're doing. And who in the world is doing that? Satan. Satan hates his creator because he was created. The Bible says the angels were created. Look at uh, Psalms chapter 89, or Psalms 89, verse 29. Psalms 89, 29. His seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. What are the days of heaven? Well, 2 Corinthians says, they're forever. But you know one thing about heaven? It's not only created by him, it's not only everlasting, but you ever thought about it, it's immeasurable? How can you ever really put figures and facts on heaven. Jeremiah chapter 31, Jeremiah 31, verse 37. Jeremiah 31 and verse 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundation of the earth, uh, the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. If heaven above can be measured, it's immeasurable. We also know one thing about heaven found in Psalm 20, verse 6. It's holy. No sin can be allowed to enter in. Psalms 20, verse 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. I love verse 7. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in might, some trust in whatever. I don't trust in anything but God. You know, so many Christians put their trust in so many things. People put their th trust in so many things. It doesn't matter, as I was reading a devotional a couple weeks ago, it doesn't matter who sits on the throne of this world, as long as we have assurance of who sits on the throne of heaven. And you know what? Satan's try to revolt didn't work out very well. God is always on the throne. And like I said this morning, our world has seen some rough times. I can't imagine, I was reading a devotional on Monday about a 16th century, excuse me, yeah, 16th century preacher that was burnt at the stake because he spoke out against Roman Catholicism. Before they did, the atrocity they did to his family in front of his eyes to make him recant 
and ask the Pope forgiveness for blasphemy. He said, I will never ask forgiveness of man for telling the truth from God's heaven. They beheaded his child in front of him, slowly. He said, that is fine. I will see my young lass again. Then they did awful things to his wife. This is the church, quote unquote. And he says, but ass, you've just set our soul at peace for all of eternity. Then they begin to torture him with unimaginable things. And you know what? The people that were pinning this says, no matter what they did, he was at peace. I guarantee you God gave him that grace to where he didn't feel a thing. They said he sang. He meditated. He quoted verses to the anger of the priest. And finally he says, it is no use. He is a heretic. And they burn him. And he sang a psalm while he was burning. And he said, Lord, my soul is committed to your everlasting arms. In thee I finish the race you've given me. And he passed away. This is where, why? He knew his home was in heaven. The Bible says the they can't take our soul. They can hurt our body, but they cannot take our soul. Who made that preacher's body? God did. And as the transcribers were telling about that man, whose name no one would know, that man God gave grace immeasurable to. Just as he did with Stephen, who fell asleep while being stoned. Why? Because he had a vision of heaven and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father welcoming home. It's just a body. If God cannot give the Christians that grace as they pass from this life to the next, what kind of God he is? Time and time again, I've read enough about Fox's Book of Martyrs and other times where Christians have been tormented during the time of Nero. And Nero would get so frustrated because Christians would be torn apart with jackals and they would be singing. He says, why aren't they screaming? God was in the midst. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked, they had no idea God was going to be in there. But they would not compromise and they would not bend. Daniel had no idea God would shut the lion's mouth. He was prepared because he had purpose in his heart as a young lad not to defile himself. We may not know if God is going to walk with us and be there, but we know that God is there. We may not receive the miracle we're looking for, but is not heaven a miracle? Is not heaven our ultimate goal? And this is why heaven is holy. And some trust in chariots. But David says, I trust in God. God is Lord of all. God reigns in. Turn with me to Psalms 11. Psalms 11 and verse 4. God is the Lord of heaven, but God also reigns in heaven. In 11.4, the Bible says the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men. You just have to read David, and don't you think that he saw the atrocities of Saul? Notice what he says here. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. God is on the throne and he sees everything. But this is a testament to God's mercy and God's grace. Because if not, if he was a God of vengeance, 
would this not world be wiped out already for all the wickedness it does? This is where we think about how merciful God is. God continues to give man an opportunity to repent. As in the testimony that was given earlier, God is merciful. So many times I've seen God work in this ministry where God has showed mercy upon someone. It just shows you that God's not willing that any should perish. But that all should come to the saving grace. All. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. He wept for Jerusalem knowing that in just a matter of days they would beat him unrecognizable. They would put him on the cross and say crucify him, crucify him. We'll take a convicted criminal over Jesus Christ. Talk about an evil heart. Well, I'll take the murder of Barabbas over Jesus who healed my friends, who fed the 5,000, who did so many great things, but because the religious leaders did not like the truth, kill him. The truth has always been bashed through all of eternity. We know the devil loves to twist the truth. And we know what comes out of his mouth is a lie. But aren't you glad that God is holy? He's the Lord of heaven. He reigns in heaven. His throne, as we saw, is in heaven. But you know that God also sends judgment from heaven? Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. And verse 18, please, Romans chapter 1. We know that he rained fire and brimstone from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness and their rejection of him. Romans chapter 1. This is a perfect example of the world we live in today. For the wrath of God, in verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Get that statement? Hold the truth in unrighteousness. It bothers me when Christians repeat untruths because they heard it. And they're adamant. And I just shake my head and go, if you had any common sense, you would study for yourself instead of taking someone's word for it. But so many Christians believe so many lies, and I'm like, are you serious? Just because someone says it doesn't mean it's the truth. And why do we as Christians want to listen to the world and take their advice? They're not out to make it better. They're out for themselves. Christians, we ought to wake up and take the truth and take the word of God and say, does this add up? Do some studies. Don't be so gullible. Because this is, the Bible says, he, they take the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it unto them. The reason many don't take the truth and run with it is because it's not popular. Why are the churches no longer preaching sin is sin? Because it's not popular. Well, it's proven now that there are just as many divorces and uh, adulterous affairs in churches as in the world. Why? Because no one wants to talk about it. Because it's not popular. So, the Bible says, one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. Hello? No one wants to talk about abortion but the Bible says if you offend a little child it's better to millstone be hung around your neck you imagine these defenseless children oh, we can't kill a puppy you'll go to prison for killing a puppy but who cares about a little child I do my middle daughter was premature I have a nephew that is now four and a half years old that was 20 weeks still a baby but he's alive today we when sabrina was born premature there was a little boy that was how many weeks 20 21 it was no bigger than my hand and it was an incubator and doing good and it was so neat to see the pride of that parents look at this little was it one one and a half pounds 
It, it was so tiny, but the fingers were so, everything was perfectly formed. And I thought, parents across this nation would discard it as a blob. Yet, I wonder if the child, if God's mercy would lane still living, he would be 17 as well. You know, God created us. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, but Christians no longer talk about that. It's politically inconvenient. The Bible tells us that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Where's his wrath on the church? How deep an indignation toward the church because we are to be his mouthpiece and we're silent. One of our members who is longtime members with the Lord now, he was preaching in a church here in Oshawa in the 90s, I believe, just before he came to our church in 2000s. And they told him, you can preach. Now this is a Baptist church. But don't preach on the blood. Don't preach on the spirit. And they gave him a list of, don't preach on the cross. Don't preach on this. He said, what's the point of preaching then? If I can't preach on the cross and I can't preach on the blood, I can't preach on the spirit, I can't preach on this, what do you preach? Kumbaya? <laughs> Let's all get around the campfire and sing la, 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 and we're all good. That's not a church. That's a social club. We are to preach without heaven, without hell, without saving grace, without repentance. What do we have? Without Christ dying on the cross for us, what do we have? If we don't preach Christ crucified, then how in the world can we preach heaven? If we don't preach Christ crucified, how do we preach about mercy? How do we preach about grace? How do we preach about forgiveness? How do we really preach about love? That's what the world talks about. Love, 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 love. Love comes from God, the Bible says, because he first loved us. This is not love today. Love, the Bible says, covers the multitude of sins. People, as long as you agree with me, we're good. You disagree with me, and I'm going to punch you, and I'm going to hit you, and I'm going to call you names, and I'm going to defame you. That's not love. The Bible is all-inclusive. We cannot just pick and choose. I've talked to a pastor of a large denomination and asked them what they preach because I know where the church stands on everything. And I'm not considered very good in standing with that church because I preach about everything. They said, well, we preach in Matthew. We preach in Luke. We preach some in John, some in Mark. Do you preach in Romans? Oh, no. Do you preach it? No, no, we don't preach that. Do you preach in the Old Testament? Oh, that doesn't apply to us anymore. I said, what do you preach out of? We're going to take this page. Oh, this, this page is acceptable. This page is not. And I'm just sitting there listening to them speak to me of what they preach and what they don't preach. And I'm like, wow, no wonder your church is in the shape it is in. Let's just rip out anything that's offensive because we don't want to offend anybody. Well, when the Bible says no one can go to heaven and Revelation says, no whoremonger, no liar, no adulterer, no this, no that can enter into heaven. Well, wouldn't you want to tell people that? Hey, there's a safe city in Oshawa from the plague, but you can't go in there if you're this and this and this and this. Wouldn't you want to warn people that if you got this, don't bother trying because they're trying to keep the city safe? Hello? You'd want to tell people, but people don't want to hear that. He sends judgment. Did you realize that repentance causes joy in heaven? Causes great joy. Lori and I have been in our ministry, been a part of several churches. And it's amazing how churches, now we're all believers. We're, we're to get excited when someone gets saved. Because you realize that they're out of the devil's grasp. Sometimes I think we're in a funeral when someone gets saved. Well, brother so-and-so, you bring them up front and they confess before the church. I just asked Jesus Christ, amen. 
Get excited. Someone just got saved. Someone's no going to hell anymore. Amen. Some churches, it's like people still flipping through the bulletins like, ah, lunchtime. And we've been to other churches where people will get up and go, praise God, another one out of the devil. Get excited about it. Because you know what the Bible says? Look, look in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. It's almost like a dead, dead man society. We ought to be excited when somebody gets saved. We ought to be excited when they follow the Lord in believer's baptism because it's a testimony that they are no longer that person. It is a picture of dying in Christ and raising in the newness of life. Chapter 15 and verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Jesus is telling through the parable because the Pharisees were not happy that people were getting saved. He said there's joy in heaven over one sinner over the 99 that are the pompous religious fools. God loves that one sinner no matter who he is. Doesn't matter what she's been. No matter what he's been. Doesn't matter what that child has done. God loves all people from every nation and wants them all to be saved. I love, remember one lady uh, in Haiti. She'd worked for us for many years helping us get navigating. And she says, aren't you glad God only sees two colors? And I could still, she lives in Montreal now, but she said, God sees two colors. And I says, I was just young and said, oh yeah? She goes, he sees black and he sees red. He said, black is when we're all sinners. And red is when we're all his child. You know, he doesn't see Haitians and Europeans and Asians and this. He sees if we're still black in sin or under washed as white as snow under the blood of the Lamb. It's mankind that sees people. God doesn't care. We have the story of the alabaster. She was a prostitute. Didn't matter to God. Go and sin no more. The lady caught in adultery. The demon of Gendera, the guy that was filled with a thousand demons, running around naked and screaming and hollering. But when he got saved, he was clothed in his right mind sitting at the feet of Jesus. God transforms men. God saved the thief on the cross. God saved Peter. God saved Paul, murderer of the church, and used him to preach the gospel. God wants everyone to go to heaven. And he gives them a very simple plan of salvation. Accept that we believe, repent, and receive. We've got to accept his plan. We've got to believe that without him, we can't get into heaven. We've got to believe on his gift that he gave at Calvary. We've got to repent of our sins. And the greatest thing, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, with our mouth, confession is made. Folks, it's not hard. The Bible tells us we need childlike faith. Heaven is open so easily to that sinner. But man confuses it. Oh, I got to work. I got I to gotta do something for it. No, no. You can work all you want, but you're never going to get to heaven. You can be as religious as you want, but you're never going to get to heaven. It is at the foot of the cross as so many preachers have preached before me, it is level at the foot of the cross. Doesn't matter if you're a rich man, poor man, doesn't matter what country you come from, everybody is a sinner. Like Paulette said, God sees two colors. When we come to the foot of the cross, we're black and covered in sin. And when we ask Jesus Christ, we leave. Our sins are as scarlet. They're washed white as snow. Every time I see the snowfall in our great country, it reminds me how pure we are in Christ Jesus. 
I don't feel very pure sometimes. But when God forgives us of our sins, man, what a feeling that is. Knowing that our God hears us, forgives us, loves us. No matter what we've done. Look at Peter. One chapter, he's cursed God. Cursed man says, I never knew him. The next he's sitting at breakfast with him and says, Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. Aren't you glad God is so loving? God is so forgiving. Look what God did with Peter. What a great preacher he became. God can do all things with all people. One of the greatest things I believe we can ever be rewarded with if he never gave us one reward for our service, heaven. Isn't that just enough <laughs> to know that you have a home in heaven that's perfect in all ways? That's reward enough, but he just doesn't leave it there. God rewards us so much more as our service is fitting. I'm so glad that even heaven gets excited about what God loves and he loves the sinner. Christians, we ought to be getting excited about the sinners. We ought to be desiring the sinners come here. Not so that we can change them because we can never change a person. Not so that we can meet their needs but that we can show them Jesus and take him, lead him to the foot of the cross. So they can see the Jesus we know. The man that loved me. That gave his life for me. That I can have that peace. That passes all understanding. Even in the midst of the craziest circumstances. No matter what befalls us. We can have hope and peace. That this is not our home. We're just passing through. Happiness can never explain Christians can never explain the happiness they have through Jesus Christ it just it's one of those things you just can't under, can't explain to somebody that doesn't have Jesus how happy you are because heaven is called a heavenly country in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 16 it says the heavenly country I'm so glad that we've got a country after this one we live in a great land. It's got a lot of problems, but a great land compared to most. But aren't you glad the next country will have no problems? Will have no corruption? Because it has no sin. It's holy. Heaven is for real. There are so many things and so many verses we can continue to go through. But for the sake of time, we must close. But heaven is real, folks. And it is attainable. Not by works, but by grace. And I pray that we as Christians during this time, that you and I will let Christ's light shine through us. Pray. You never know what God can do to use something in your life to draw someone to Christ. So let's pray for our family. Let's pray for our neighbors. Let's pray that God would use us in a mighty way to reach someone. Let's make heaven joyous this week by seeing a sinner come home. Can we do it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Let Christ use you this week. Because we know heaven's our home, but the world out there does not. They need a witness. How beautiful are the feet of those that share the gospel, the Bible says. There's no greater task we can be given as being a gospel witness. I pray that this week. We have the hope. Let's share the hope. Let's shine the light of Jesus Christ. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for your love, for mercy. We thank you for your promises that if I go I will come again 
Lord Heaven. is immeasurable and really, in all honesty, undescribable. We have a glimpse of how beautiful heaven is. But, oh Lord, our human eyes will never comprehend the magnitude of its beauty. Because the center of all the beauty of heaven is the glory of the Lord. And, Lord, we know that even Moses could not look upon your face, but the glory of the hinder part would have been just amazing. Lord, I thank you that you are a holy God reigning in the heavens with justice, but also with mercy. Lord, we ask you that you would just watch out over each and every one this week. Continue to be with the nice. Have your will and way in their lives. That no matter what may happen, you may get the honor and the glory through all the circumstances. Lord, be with our church tonight. And Lord, I ask you that you would just work in our lives and help us be the witness we need to be for the sake of the dying world around us. We give you the honor and the glory. Bring us back on Wednesday night as we open up the Word of God and we continue to study about what you want from us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every morning Wednesday. And once again, uh, if you think of something you'd like to ha hear from God's Word, uh, make sure you text it to me by Tuesday, and I'll do my best to study it out and pray which way God directs. But challenge me. Love forward to take God's Word and show each and every one of you what God says about a certain subject. Lord bless, and have a great week.